For those of you who, who may be new, I'm not Albert McGowan Jr. I'm someone else. My name is Ryan. I'm the assistant minister here, and so joyed to, to share the word with you this morning as we finish up a series I've been doing for, for a little while now on the Beatitudes. So this will be our last one. Let's pray and ask God to bless this time. Lord, you are near to the brokenhearted. Compassionate and merciful to those who are decimated by life. Thank you, Lord, that you know our needs even before we do and that you are at work to meet our needs. Thank you for the way that you meet our most basic need through the Word, the Scriptures you have given, the to know and to understand you, to hear your Spirit speaking. Lord, we have no more fundamental need than that. And so we ask that we would come needy today. Rid us of our arrogance. Rid us of our pride before you. Make us humble. That we might receive the word as the dry ground receives the rain. Nourish, strengthen us, convict us of our sins, set us on a path of new obedience through this time together. In Christ's name, amen. If you'll turn to Matthew 5, the eighth beatitude, I'm going to read chapter 5 of Matthew, the first 12 verses. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great for your reward is great in heaven, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word to us. May he bless it now to our hearing. It's a sobering thing to, to have been alive long enough to, to see the fashion carousel make a second time around. I was born in 1981, and so my early years were the dreaded 80s, where everything was tacky and classless from my perspective as a young man. You know, fuchsia and pink, and it's just too much. The 90s, on the other hand, were a glorious era, (laughs) an era where fashion just made sense. We wore Doc Martens, and we wore baggy jeans, and we wore Uh, flannel shirts uh, untucked, uh, open to the t-shirts. And white boys like me, we we grew our hair long for (laughs) headbanging. Seemed normal to me, but my parents, they looked on with bewilderment. Why would you want to look like a homeless person? (laughs) They also knew that that this was not the first time this this fashion had happened. They, They had lived through the 60s, so they knew a little bit about long hair and baggy clothes, right? Totally blind to it. In college, the early 2000s was a a, a revival of the 70s. That 70s show. That was us. We we wore um, uh, flared jeans. Uh, We didn't need them. We just wore them. And uh, we wore uh, we wore. I I I owned silk shirts in college, which feel weird. Very weird. 
and, and, and tight, great, like graphic T-shirts. We, we had all that. Uh, it seemed normal to me, but again, my parents uh, shaking their heads. What are you? What are you thinking? I remember when I saw the horse come around for the first time. Again, it was early in my time here at Redeemer. It was probably 2010, 11, and I uh, came into the youth the youth room one Sunday morning, and in walks a teenage girl who actually is now an adult in our church and is here today in this service, and so I'm going to not look at her. <laughs> and she walks into Sunday school wearing a dress that I'm sure my mother wore in 1986. <laughs> it was uh, hot pink or something. I don't know. It had shoulder pads, which are cool. Shoulder pads are cool. Big, poofy shoulders and sleeves. And I, I'm a shepherd of teenagers. I care about them, and so I want to, I want to help. And so I'm trying to like distract the, the crowd, like, hey, hey, look over there, look out the window. And uh, to my utter surprise, a flock of girls descends. <laughs> oh my gosh, your dress is beautiful. <laughs> Where did you get it? It's lovely. It was in that moment I knew I'd become my father. <laughs> Pause that, for, that scene for a minute. Pause that scene, Emma. <laughs> you know it's you. Uh, and I want to ask a question of that scene. What does it say about human nature that me and those girls saw the same thing so differently? Like our, our eyes and our brains registered the same colors, the same ruffles. And I said, ah. And these girls were adoring. I think what it says, and probably what it reveals, is that human beings, we are creatures of conformity. Like, we need to have a place. We need to belong in a group. And fashion, what we like, is not so much, uh, it's not objective, you know. This is the right and good thing. It's, it's what the people that you want to like you, you like what they like. So even those who, who are, are claimed to be nonconformists, like, oh, I'm, I don't have any lines. Well, you're just conforming to nonconformity, a group that finds its identity in not conforming to the group. As we all learn, uh, at least with fashion, there are costs to nonconformity. To truly not find a place and fit in and, and submit to the gravity of conformity is to risk being isolated, and to risk being rejected. I think that dynamic that is true about human nature, not just in fashion, but in more basic issues, issues like uh, what matters in life, what is, Im what is important, what, what is right and wrong, how should we think about God, how should we think about eternal and spiritual things and, and, and goodness, that even in those things we see a a power of conformity at work that's generational and that's cultural, that, that, that we believe like people believe around us. We don't believe randomly. We don't think randomly that human beings are conformist. And there is a cost even in these matters, especially in, the, in these matters of not conforming. As Christians, those who know the word of God, who have come to know Christ through the Bible, we know that this conformity is not benign often, that, that we as human beings are united. We are conformed in our rebellion against our maker and our creator, that we are creatures who are in Adam, fallen in him, and therefore we together are born slaves of Satan, enemies of God. And there is a power at work in our world, a spiritual power. It's the, this vast gravity of conformity to, to sin and to rebellion. A, a conformity that sucks all creation down the drain into death and into hell. And it is absolutely powerful in every human culture and in every human generation. The Bible teaches us that we as Christians, those who are called out, we are to live as unique people in this world. We are, we are to, to do what we cannot do in our own power, which is stand up to the powers of conformity in the, in the evil spiritual places and say, no, 
God has called us out to be different. He's called us out to, be, to, to reflect a different world and different values. And he calls us to expect that that will bring trouble into our lives. See, the cost for nonconformity is always persecution. And if you are faithful as a member of the body of Christ in this world, you will be, as Peter Kreft, the author, says, indigestible to the world. Listen to him. The world can digest any food made of its own substance, grown in its own garden, but it simply cannot digest heavenly food. It will always vomit up Christ and his church as alien or threatening, or else it will try to tame Christ, humanize Christ, reinterpret Christ in socially acceptable, currently fashionable ways, its ways, so that it can digest the new sugar-covered pill. An index of the church's fidelity to her master is her indigestibility. When the world accepts the church, the church is no longer the church. You see, persecution and being hated by the world is a necessary consequence of faithfulness. It's, 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 it's a lot that you are called to. The amazing thing about the scriptures is that not only does it call us to, to be indigestible and to suffer as a response to it, it also calls us to take joy in it. Do you hear what I said? To take joy in being hated. That's what our Lord Jesus commends to us in this last beatitude. He is beginning his ministry and at the beginning of Matthew. He is, he, is, he is teaching and proclaiming the kingdom that is coming with his, his coming and that, is, that will be established through his death and resurrection and that one day will fill the earth. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's giving the constitution of this kingdom. What will its people look like? They will look different. That those who follow him are not signing up for an easier life. They're signing up for a more difficult life. And he says in this last beatitude, in an extended way, blessed, truly happy, are those who are persecuted for righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want us to ask this morning three questions of this beatitude that will help us get our minds around it and, and hopefully they will lead us to know how to live in light of it. The first, what is this persecution? The second, where should we expect to experience it? And the third, what should our response be to it? And my prayer for you this week and for the church at Redeemer is that he would be at work by his spirit to purify his bride. That we would leave this place more indigestible to the world. That we would be willing and prepared to suffer and to do so with joy. First question, what is this persecution? This persecution, we see, is broad. By that, I mean that it's not just physical persecution. Often you will hear critics point out that there's something crass about American Christians complaining about persecution. That it's much like the boy who cried wolf crying wolf. You know, you've seen it on Facebook, maybe, the person who goes to Target in December and, and posts that uh, the cashier wished me a happy holidays, not Merry Christmas, just like Jesus said, persecution is going to come. <laughs> And the critics, the critics are, are right to hold, up, to hold up what persecution means in, say, Syria. When ISIS comes into town and it's, it's, it's your neck or recanting. It's your, your daughters and your wife are, come with us into slavery or you renounce Christ. And they say, happy holidays is persecution? And the critics are saying something that we need to hear. 
And it's exactly what the author of Hebrews even said to, to the churches that he wrote to. He said, he said, remember that in your suffering against sin, you haven't, you haven't shed your blood. And, and that's a big deal. Remember, American Christians, don't exaggerate your persecution and your suffering. That's not what the persecuted do. They don't post it for social media purposes. Those who are truly persecuted. And so there's something important there. Yet also, people of God, there's a danger that we overly narrow persecution to only physical harm. That persecution is something that happens to the unlucky few far, far away. And isn't it good to live in the South where we need not suffer persecution? Well, how do we square that sentiment with the fact that the New Testament promises every Christian always who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted? Well, it's our definition, and Jesus helps us. In verse 11, he, he unpacks this word persecute for us. He says, blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. You see, two of three of these verbs that he used to unpack what persecution is are not physical, they're verbal. You see this? Blessed are you when others revile you. That means to be spoken to and to be told you're evil, to be hated with another's tongue. Does that sound familiar at all? What about uttering false things against you. We call that slander. Have you ever felt, sometimes as a Christian, that others are saying things about you that aren't true? That they're, they're indicting your character from afar? They're calling you immoral? They're calling you wrong? You see, Jesus is not just talking about Syria. He's addressing us in Jackson, Mississippi. That in every culture... And therefore, in our culture, there is, there is suffering for the faithful. It may not be as crude as lions, but it is real. Listen to Peter Kreeft again. In a simple and cruel, and, and cruel society, persecution takes a cruel and simple form. Christians are thrown to the lions. In a comfortable and complex society like ours, persecution is more insidious because it is masked. It is an attack on the mind, not the body. It takes place in the media, not the Colosseum. We have a war of words, not gladiators. So I want you to be ready. I want you to find this broadly. I want you to realize that when you walk into your workplace, students, when you go to college, when you go to your high school, when you walk into social settings, there is persecution that the Lord is calling you to bear. It is not just a sword. I like to be liked. I like to be thought a good man. And I fight pretty hard to protect that. So what is this persecution? It's broad. It's not just the sword, it's words. Second is that it's for righteousness. It is persecution for righteousness, falsely. that they're, they're saying false things about you. And so what this means is that if you're being persecuted because you are rude, disrespectful, judgmental, that's on you. Don't imagine that there is blessing for bad behavior as a Christian. Telling it like it is, without regard for people. Jesus is, is not blessing you. Rather, this defiance that we are to have against the world is a, is a, is a meek defiance. It is a loving and gentle defiance. It is a, it is a defiance that is, a, is subversive and offensive, not because of us, but because of the one whom we represent, the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. And, and for those of us who have been bought out of this world, we... we we long, we hunger and thirst for his righteousness. We hunger and thirst for his goodness and holiness and his truth to be known and to be embodied in this world. It's our prayer life. Your will be done, Lord. We want your will. 
And because we long so passionately for, for Christ to be known and for his glory to be displayed, we, we do not content ourselves with silence. As the world slanders our Lord, as the world uh, treats his gospel as, as a light and meaningless thing, that our passion and our longing for Christ and for his kingdom are what motivates us and are what causes the offense. We must live it out. We must embody it. We must speak. Jesus uses a phrase to parallel suffering for righteousness in, in this passage. In verse 11, he says, suffering or being persecuted for me. You see, our, our association, the reason we are hated in the world is because the world that is the same as it was when Jesus was in this, was here, it's the same powers at work, hated him to the point of murder. And so you think you come along and if you are a little Christ in your world that you are going to be loved, it's the same world that killed Christ. Jackson, Mississippi, in its wickedness and in its enslavement to Satan, is the same world that crucified Christ. And you think you're going to show up and have no trouble there? No. As goes the head, so goes the body. So I want you to consider, is the offense that you give to the world is your own immaturity? Or is it the offense of Christ? His cross is supremely offensive for it speaks of God's holiness and it speaks of man's hopelessness. In our flesh, we hate the cross because it's an insult. I need that? Yes. Make sure you're offending with that cross. So what is this persecution? It is broad and it is for, for righteousness sake. It is, it is. Second question, which, where should we expect to experience it? The answer to this question, I think, is we should expect to experience it in the places where the gospel is most offensive in our culture. Here's what I mean. There is no human culture that, that is not offended by the gospel. It doesn't matter if you're in Syria. It doesn't matter if you're in the deep south. The gospel pushes against every human culture and every generation. It challenges it. It gets underneath its skin. But it does so differently in every culture. So the way that we, 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 we find out where we should expect to experience persecution is we look for where, where is the place of conformity in our culture? Where is the place where the gospel is offensive particularly? And we realize that to stand there particularly is to put yourself in the line of fire. The Lord calls us not particularly to other places, but to those places. That's where our faithfulness will be determined. Listen to Martin Luther. He knew a little bit about something about the offending people with the gospel and with bad behavior. <laughs> if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are attacking at that moment, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all battlefields, besides that one, is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Where the battle rages, there our loyalty is tested. So where are these places? Like I said, they're different. So in the first century... The Jewish church at the very beginning, the place of offense was circumcision. That's why so much of the New Testament is talking about circumcision. It's because it was profoundly offensive to early people, early first century Jews who were Christians. Their early church grew out of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. 
it was very offensive to welcome in Gentile people without circumcising them because circumcision was a sign of ethnic purity. It's the same old stuff here. But it's different because, because the church had to stand against that because Christ had said, uh, belonging in the family of God is not about matters of, of food. It's not about matters of circumcision. It's about matters of faith in Christ. And therefore, the church had to declare a message to that world that, that deeply offended its values. So much of the New Testament is about, it's about the apostles struggling with, with will, we, will we stand there? Or can we sort of like, soften our stance on that a little bit. And what the apostles eventually come to is, is they stand before a Jewish world and they say, over our dead body, will you make Gentiles of second-class citizens in this family? Over our dead bodies. And a lot of them got their wish. But it wasn't until they stood where the battle raged on that point that the church scattered and was persecuted. In our culture, in our world, you don't get in trouble for saying circumcision is not necessary for salvation. Like, you say that at a dinner party and conversation goes, okay, cool. <laughs> it's not the place anymore. Consider the Reformation. The Reformation, as we're talking about Luther here, the place uh, where the battle raged was on the issue of authority, but particularly for Luther, it was about indulgences. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, was, was, had this system of, of, of giving out pieces of paper, basically, in exchange for money. And these paper, these indulgences, represented forgiveness of sins and, and freedom from purgatory and the next life for relatives. And so the question of that time was, was, is the Roman church right to deal out salvation in exchange for, for money? And that sounds silly to us. I mean, to say indulgences are wrong. Well, they are wrong. You know, your life's going to go fine if that's your thing. Even the Roman Catholic Church, is not, they're not fighting for indulgences anymore. And yet in that day, you know what it meant? It meant that you were going head to head with the most powerful entity on the planet. And that's what Luther, and that's what the Reformers did. They said, over our dead body, will you teach these people that they have to pay for their salvation? And they suffer. So what about us? Well, I think that the places of conformity are many, and they're varied based on the community you come from, your subculture. But there's a couple of big ones, right? I think we all could, I think of the exclusivity of the gospel, that is that Jesus, only Jesus and not others, and issues of sexuality and ethics. And so, so you want to really... You want to really offend and get in trouble? You do this in love, first of all. Like I said, this is not a show. And this is in the context of relationships, and it's, in, it's as a human being living among and loving people. But you want to get in trouble, you stand and say, there's one God, there's not no gods, there's not many gods, there's just one, and he's my God. And that one God sent his son to die and he's the only way. Like, there's no, like, if, you, if you're a great person, but you don't have faith in him, you are going to hell. Like, it doesn't matter how sincerely you hold your beliefs. That is completely irrelevant. Unless you have faith in him, you will perish eternally. You, you want to know how to mess up a dinner party? <laughs> Or to say, you know, there's a God and he sort of created sexuality. And uh, I, you know, sometimes I, we fe all feel things sexually that, that um, we don't act on. And, and ultimately the judge is not your sincere feeling about how you would like to express yourself sexually. That, like that will put you under God's condemnation and judgment. That every way sexually that is not man and woman in relationship with life for one another is it will bring destruction into your life. And it doesn't matter if you say it's not destruction. That's fine. You can say whatever you want to say. It's true. To say that to our world is, is to, to put a bullseye on your head. And it's to be called 
to open yourself up to be called names that nobody likes to be called. And you see, it's precisely in these places that the Lord has called us. It is no sacrifice to say, God is a God of love. Is that true? It is true. But if you stand up and say, I, I need the world to know that my God is a God of love, that is not the place where the battle is raging right now. The place the battle is raging is, is, is on the justice of God and his holiness and whether he, he will judge the world. And it is to that place that we are called. It's to that place that you're going to be tempted to equivocate and to soften and to skirt and to say, well, you know, the Bible says many funny, funny things. How many of us know believers who once walked with the Lord, but now they've slowly wandered off because, well, you know, I read this book and we don't really know what God said. They're not doing that on circumcision. Nobody has new information from God on, on indulgences. It happens to be that denominations and people who are issuing statements saying, we've decided that God is vague on these things. It's always on the places where there's problem. And what I'm saying to you is that is old-fashioned cowardice. It's cowardice. It is cowardice like the German church in the 1930s and 40s as they saw Hitler rise and they realized that to stand against this man in this conformity is to risk your life. And they said, well, God, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Um, we're just not going to talk about that because that's a, that's a state matter. And the Lord has ordained the state. It's cowardice. And it's cowardice, just like the, the majority church in America for so long. That has stood complicit with a culture that dehumanizes people racially, that dehumanizes native peoples and, and justifies their obliteration, and that stands there and says, well, you know, uh, these are not our things. It's cowardice, and it's fear of trouble. We can declare the truth of God clearly on every other point, but if on those points where the battle rages, we back off and soften our stance and act like God is, God is unsure of himself. We show our true character. May the Lord have mercy. May he make us holy. Will you fight, Christians, Redeemer Church, where the battle rages? Will you accept the consequences that come? Will you shine your light into the very darkest places of this world or only the place where there's relative sunshine. He's calling you to the battlefronts. With meekness, with love, with gentleness, to say this is our God. So where should we expect it? We should expect it where the battle rages. We should expect it at the places of offensiveness. And the last question is this, what should our response be? Like so much of Jesus' commands, what he calls us to goes against everything that is natural. I hate it when I'm talked badly about, and particularly when it's not true. Jesus says, when they speak badly of you because of me, rejoice and be glad, find joy in it. Jesus is not a, sadistic master. He's, it's not pleasure in pain for pain's sake. It is, it is pleasure in what persecution reveals about us. What it reveals about our identity. And what persecution reveals about our destiny. Our identity. Persecution reveals the family that we belong to. Jesus draws this comparison they persecuted the prophets before you the same way. So what he's saying to us is a sign of your pedigree, a sign of your good blood, is being hated by the world. Because when you do that, when the world spits you out and vomits you up, when you are indigestible to it, you are taking a place of honor. It was occupied by the prophets of old, the prophets 
those people of God all throughout time who have stood in the places in their world and said, thus saith the Lord, to the places where it was hard and the, and the world has, has vomited them up, persecuted them, dishonored them, killed them. It's just like Zach reading Jeremiah. And we could spend all afternoon talking about those who lived this way, who stood at the hard places and who sat over my dead body and who suffered for it. It's a family line that was dishonored in their day, but as their generation passes, as the conformity of their age passes and everyone realizes, oh, that was really dumb. Now they're the ones who are honored. They're the ones who have been proven true. While the generations and their, their enterprises, their projects, their values have all faded away. They are people, the author of Hebrews says, of whom the world was not worthy. The world is not worthy of you. Just like the world was not worthy of our Jesus. He was dishonored. When we're persecuted, we show that we have the DNA of our older brother, the Lord Jesus. We as Southerners should understand this particularly because family matters here in a powerful way. And I say that as an outsider in some ways. Um, it, I'm from Atlanta, and so Atlanta's a bit less like the South than Mississippi. But in Mississippi, and I love this about Mississippians, two Mississippians meet, and they immediately try to figure out, okay, so who's your, like, did you, what's your last name? What's your mother's last name? You know, do you, so-and-so lives in down the road and blah, 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 blah. And it's like this, this like, oh, you look like, you know, you're great. And there's great honor here in being connected with people that are known, like in being people that were pillars. Uh, and that's a, that's a neat thing. We have joy. And I, I love to see Mississippians take joy when it's like, oh, you know, your grandmother was my cousin who was the third time of the fourth removed, the seventh. <laughs> and Mississippians find their identity in that connection. So, people of God, we, we must find our identity, our identity, and take joy in our identity. And yet the sign of our identity is being hated. It's not a last name. It's not a physical characteristic. It's, it's not a, a grandfather or father. The sign of the family is that the family is despised by the world. So as you suffer and as you are persecuted because you stand on those hard places, remember it says something about your family. It says something about your identity. The second part, the reason why we should have joy is because it speaks to our destiny. Jesus says theirs is the kingdom of heaven and that there is great reward for those who are persecuted now. As the saints in the Lord Jesus are honored, so will we be in the world that is to come. It's a world where sin and death are no more. It's a world that will, will endure forever after this world fades away. And Jesus promises us extravagant things, that we will rule and reign there, that we will be kings and queens of the new heavens and the new earth, that we will judge the nations alongside Jesus, that we will be honored in proportion to our dishonor. So when you are dishonored, you take joy because you know you're making deposits in a future honor and in a future joy that is so much greater than anything this world could offer us and conformity can win for you. I love how John Calvin talks about this. He says, as soon as we raise our minds to heaven, we there behold vast grounds of joy which dispel sadness. Persecution is our passport. It's a reminder that we come from another country. Every time you are dishonored for Christ, it's an opportunity to remember home. To see the vast grounds of joy that are stored up for you. An eternity of joy and pleasure. 
our response inexplicably should be joy. Joy for it speaks to our identity and destiny. So three questions. What is this persecution? It is broad. It is for righteousness. Where should we expect to experience it? Where the battle rages in our culture, the places of conformity? And what should our response be? It should be joy for it speaks to our identity and our destiny. The best novel I've read, I'm going to end here, don't worry. Lunch is fine. <laughs> best novel I've read in the past five years is All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. It was recommended to me by Paul Rankin, who's a great guy and a great mind. It's not just us, though. It's a, it won the Pulitzer Prize last year. So if you need summer reading, check out this book. It's great. Tells the story of two teenagers in World War II Europe, a French girl named Marie Laure and a German boy named Werner. Tells the story of how their lives intersect serendipitously. One point in the story, Werner is sent off to a boarding camp for future Nazi soldiers. And as you might imagine, this boarding school is a place of conformity in the worst sort of way. It is a place where young boys, boys still in, in their childhood, still, still deep in their humanity, are taught to see Jewish people as subhuman and unworthy of life. It's a place where all the power of conformity is to help these young boys be able to kill people. One of the very sad parts of this book is, is seeing Werner fight against that unsuccessfully. He's a boy just like any boy. He knows love, he knows kindness, he knows compassion, and yet he's in this, this, this culture of conformity, and, and he knows that the consequences for not conforming are grave. And we watch as he fails. There's one scene where we see this. An escapee from a work camp is found in the woods near the school. He's a, he's a, a man, a Jewish man, who is, who is nearly starved to death, who has threadbare clothes, in the freezing cold of winter, and he's caught and he's brought into and chained up at the center of this courtyard in this school. And again, as a part of this process of hardening these young boys, uh, they have to, to take a bucket of cold water and throw it on the man. To not do so means big trouble. And it's so sad to see Werner give in and do it. But there's a contrast to Werner in the story. It's a boy named Frederick. It's a boy who, who stands as a foil against, against Werner's capitulation. He is one in whom the spark of humanity has not been extinguished yet. Let me read this account briefly. They start one by one. Each instructor takes a full bucket from Volkheimer and flings its contents at the prisoner a few feet away. Cheers rise into the frozen night. Three boys until Werner's turn. Two boys. When his turn arrives, Werner throws the water like all the others, and the splash hits the prisoner in the chest, and a perfunctory cheer rises. He joins the cadets, waiting to be released. Five boys later, it is Frederick's turn. Frederick, who cannot clearly see well without his glasses, who has not been cheering when each bucket full of water finds its mark, who is frowning at the prisoner as though he recognizes something there. And Werner knows what Frederick is going to do. Frederick has to be nudged forward by the boy behind him. The upperclassman hands him a bucket. Frederick pours it out on the ground. The drill leader steps forward. His face flares scarlet in the cold. Give him another! And Frederick sloshes it onto the ice at his feet. He says in a small voice, He has already finished, sir. The upperclassman hands over a third pail. Throw it! Commands the drill instructor. The night steams. The stars burn. The prisoner sways. The boys watch. The commandant tilts his head. Frederick pours the water onto the ground. I will not. Here is Werner, stands the place of conformity, and he knows the costs. 
And he says, did God really say, if I just do it, it'll be over. And here is Frederick. Frederick who says, over my dead body, I will not. I hold that contrast up for you as a mirror. Which are you? Whom will you be in the days to come? It's, it's, it's easy to make an excuse. It's easy to soften things up. Those who will be honored are those like Frederick. Frederick faced terrible consequences for what he did in the story. He eventually was beaten so badly that he was sent back to Berlin brain dead. And yet, history remembers those, not the Verners. Honor is for those who stand in the face of evil. May we, people of God, be defiant for righteousness, defiant in meekness and in love for people around us, and yet defiant nonetheless. May we live our lives saying no. And may we be found rejoicing when the hammer drops. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, dear God, uh, thank you that you do not call us to walk a path that you have not walked. Uh, you are the God of the cross. You are the one who, is, who has walked the path of suffering unjustly. You have been willing to pour out your body, pour out your blood, and give your body for the sake of our salvation. And so we have one to look to. We do not need to think we're alone because we're not. Give your people here courage. Courage that will cause them to flee from cowardice. Courage that will give them joy when life doesn't go like they want it to because of you. Free us from the illusion that our lives in this world and in this age should be easy or fun. Free us from that terrible lie. Make us willing to live the life of the cross hoping in the world that is to come. In Jesus' name, amen.